Durban poison has been called the archetype of a true sativa, but the reason it holds that reputation isn't the shape of its leaves or its country of origin. It's because its chemistry aligns with what most people expect a sativa to deliver, stimulation, clarity, and function. The strain originates as a land race from South Africa, and when it reached Western markets in the 1970s, it was unlike anything most consumers had experienced where the Afghan and Kush varieties that dominated hash production leaned heavy with myrcene-driven sedation. Durban poison carried a volatile profile that lifted rather than grounded. This distinction made it a backbone for Dutch breeding projects and ensured its name would survive for decades, not just as a strain, but as an emblem of what sativa supposedly means. The key driver here is terpinaline. In most cannabis on the market today, terpinaline is a background player, showing up in fractions of a percent. In Durban, poison, it dominates, often in concentrations approaching or exceeding 1% of total weight, an unusual chemical fingerprint. Terpinaline's sensory profile is herbal, piney, and citrus sweet, but its influence is more than aroma. In synergy with THC, it produces an expansive headspace. Thoughts feel lighter, perception sharpens, and the high leans toward the outward and active. This is reinforced by oxymany, a terpene tied to sociability and alertness, which gives the high its characteristic openness. Limonene builds on that with mood elevation, reducing anxiety and layering in optimism. Pinun acts as a stabilizer, keeping the mind focused and memory intact, preventing the flighty scatter sometimes triggered by highly cerebral strains. Another piece often overlooked in Durban poison is its cannabinoid composition. While it is THC dominant, like most commercial cannabis, many lab tests report slightly elevated levels of THCV compared to average cultivars. Etiodiasi THCV is known for appetite suppression and a sharper, more upward energy profile. In practice, this means Durban poison doesn't just avoid couch lock. It can feel appetite dampening and mentally crisp, making it even more suited to daytime use. This cannabinoid layer is a critical piece of why Durban poison feels different from the myrcene-heavy hybrids that crowd modern menus. The physical experience is consistent with these chemical drivers. Durban poison does not weigh down the body or cause muscles to become sluggish. Instead, it preserves agility and coordination, allowing activity without interference. Stress and anxiety may soften, but the user rarely feels dulled or slowed. Physiologically, limonene is believed to interact with serotonin pathways to modulate stress, while pinene contributes to bronchodilation, literally easing airflow through the lungs. Together, they create a sense of openness and lightness, further reinforcing the impression that the high is clearing space rather than filling it. Culturally, Durban poison became the strain many pointed to as proof that the indica sativa distinction was meaningful. Consumers and growers alike would say, this is what a sativa feels like. It was held up as the counterpoint to Kush's and Afghanis, bright where they were heavy, social where they were isolating, functional where they were narcotic. Yet even here in one of the cleanest cases of a sativa experience, the truth is not in the label, but in the chemistry. Durban poison energizes not because it is a sativa, but because terpinaline, osamine, limonene, pinene, and THCV dominate its fingerprint and balance THC in a particular way. The label explains nothing. The chemistry explains everything. Hindu Kush has long been positioned as the quintessential indica, the strain that defines heaviness, sedation, and the nighttime archetype. Its name comes from the mountain range along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, where broad-leafed, resin-rich plants were cultivated for centuries, primarily to produce hashish. When Western breeders and consumers encountered it in the 1970s, Hindu Kush quickly became shorthand for body-high cannabis, a genetic foundation for countless indica hybrids. But the myth of Hindu Kush as a pure sedative doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Its chemistry reveals a much more layered picture and one that undermines the clean binary it is used to represent. 
The terpene backbone begins with myrcene, which in the Hindu Kush often dominates at a concentration of around 0.61.0% of the total weight. Myrcene is strongly linked to muscle relaxation and the melted body feel, and its presence is what grounds Hachimut Hindu Kush in its reputation. Yet Mersini alone doesn't tell the full story. Hindu Kush also carries significant levels of limonene and pinene, sometimes approaching or exceeding 0.30.5% each, and these dramatically reshape the high. Limonene adds brightness and mood elevation, creating euphoria that contradicts the idea of pure sedation. Pinon sharpens cognition and memory retention, acting as a counterweight to Mersini's heaviness. The result is a high that can leave the body calm while the mind stays lucid, sometimes even talkative or creative. Supporting terpenes include caryophylline and humulene. Caryophylline is unique among terpenes because it binds to CB2 receptors, modulating inflammation and contributing to physical ease without producing intoxication. This adds a grounding, peppery note to the experience. Humulene, a woody terpene also found in hops, can suppress appetite and deepen the earthy tone, reinforcing Hindu Kush's cultural image as a grounding strain. Together, these two explain why Hindu Kush feels physically heavy, yet not mentally overwhelming. The strain grounds the body while still leaving room for clarity. Cannabinoid composition reinforces this complexity. Hindu Kush is strongly THC dominant, often testing between 18 and Rao DE 22%, with very low CBD levels. That means its reputation for sedation cannot be attributed to CBD softening THC's psychoactivity. The experience is terpene driven. What users perceive as couch lock is the interaction of myrcene and THC, but the concurrent presence of limonene and pinun prevents the effect from collapsing into stupor. Instead, the high becomes layered, warm, body-centric calm, balanced by clear-headed euphoria. Unlike Durban poison, Hindu Kush does not typically express THCV, which means appetite suppression and sharp energy are absent. But the overlap in limonene and pinene ensures the mental tone is not as far removed as marketing suggests. In practice, Hindu Kush feels different from its stereotype. Yes, it eases muscle tension and slows movement, but many consumers report a clear, steady head rather than cognitive fog. Stress melts, but thoughts remain organized. Limbs feel heavy, but conversation is still possible. This duality explains why Hindu Kush became a backbone for breeding. It carries the body relaxation many seek, but without annihilating function. It is not the narcotic knockout that indica menus promise, but a strain that grounds without fully shutting down. Culturally, Hindu Kush has become a symbol for the indica label itself. Its role in Afghani hashish traditions and its subsequent use in Western hybridization gave it a mythic status. For decades, dispensaries have listed it as the standard bearer of the nighttime strain, the benchmark by which other indicas are measured. Yet its chemistry betrays that label. By containing limonene, pinene, and caryophyllin alongside myrcene, Hindu Kush overlaps significantly with strains that sit in the sativa camp. Consumers buying it for total sedation often find themselves reflective, social, or even lightly creative, proving that the binary is misleading. Hindu Kush is not Durban Poison's opposite. It is its supposed contrast. On menus, they are treated as ends of a spectrum, but in reality, they are closer than the labels admit. The Indica category props up an illusion that strains like Hindu Kush cannot sustain. Its body-heavy calm is real, but its chemistry ensures clarity, uplift, and balance that the binary cannot account for. Placed side by side, Durban Poison and Hindu Kush are marketed as categorical opposites. One, the definitive energizing sativa, the other, the archetypal sedating indica. On menus, they are presented as if they belong to entirely different worlds. Yet, when you compare their chemistry, the supposed gulf collapses into a shared backbone. Both strains express myrcene, limonene, and pinene in functionally significant concentrations, 
and these compounds shape the experience far more than the labels suggest. The overlap in these three terpenes alone explains why Hindu Kush doesn't always shut users down and why Durban poison never feels out of control. Instead of operating on separate poles, the two strains meet in the middle, defined more by balance than by opposition. Limonene is the clearest point of convergence. In Durban poison, it contributes to the optimistic bright tone of the high, elevating mood and giving its clarity a buoyant optimism. In Hindu Kush, limonene frequently registers in the 0.30.5% range, cutting through the mere scene heaviness and infusing the high with unexpected euphoria. In both cases, limonene makes the experience brighter, social, and more positive, qualities that completely undercut the idea of Hindu Kush as a purely narcotic strain. Pinin adds a second shared thread. In Durban poison, it stabilizes thought, preventing the terpenoline-driven high from fragmenting into distraction. In Hindu Kush, Pinin keeps cognition lucid even when the body is settling into stillness. The presence of pinin explains why both strains can leave users alert, reflective, and capable of conversation, despite being sold as polar opposites. Myrcene is where the binary is supposed to hold, Durban poison with little, Hindu Kush with a lot, but even this contrast is more about degree than kind. Durban often carries 0.2-0.3% myrcene, enough to soften the high and relax the body without anchoring it. Hindu Kush often carries closer to 0.81.0% comma, strong enough to create the muscle relaxation and heaviness it is known for, but still not so overwhelming that limonene and pinene cannot counterbalance it. In lived experience, this means Durban poison can calm the body while staying functional, and Hindu Kush can uplift the mood while relaxing the body. Neither is what the menu says they are. Both live in the in-between. Cannabinoid content sharpens the point. Durban poison's tendency to express small but measurable amounts of THCV gives it appetite-suppressing and energy-sharpening qualities, traits the sativa label happens to claim but cannot explain. Hindu Kush, by contrast, is a straight THC-dominant strain with negligible CBD and no THCV, meaning its body calm is entirely terpene-driven. Yet, because both strains run in the 18-22% THC range, and because their terpenes overlap so strongly, the actual experience is not a clash of opposites, but a convergence on balance. The problem is that cultural stereotypes amplify the divide instead of explaining the overlap. Consumers are told Durban poison is the definitive daytime strain built for energy and clarity. They are told Hindu Kush is the definitive nighttime strain, good for sedation and sleep. These narratives are so ingrained that they shape expectation before the first inhale. Someone buying Hindu Kush expecting a total shutdown may be surprised to find themselves relaxed, but still conversational, even creative. Someone buying Durban poison, expecting jittery energy, may be surprised to find steadiness and calm alongside its cerebral focus. The stereotypes persist because they are easy to market, not because they are accurate. Durban poison and Hindu Kush reveal how fragile the binary really is. They are shared terpenes, limonene, pinene, and myrcene anchor them closer together than the menu suggests. Their differences, terpenoline and oxymane on one side, caryophylline and humulene on the other, shape nuance, not opposition. Consumers expecting opposites are consistently met with similarities, and that disconnect is where the system fails. The overlap is not accidental. It is evidence that cannabis effects cannot be explained by indica or sativa categories. Chemistry, not labels, drives the high. Durban poison and Hindu kush should be the easiest pair of strains to separate. One is framed as the purest example of a sativa, the other as the definitive indica. Together, they have been used for decades to anchor the binary shorthand that dominates cannabis culture. Sativa means stimulation and focus. Indica means sedation and body melt. Yet, when you put their chemistry under the microscope, the opposite happens. Their overlap is too deep to ignore. Both are THC-dominant strains, 
typically ranging from 18 to 22 percent, with very low CBD. Both share limonene, pinene, and myrcene in meaningful amounts, and these terpenes shape mood, focus, and body response in ways that are strikingly similar. Durban poison's slightly higher expression of THCV sharpens its energy, while Hindu Kush's grounding terpenes like caryophyllene and humulene deepen its body calm. But even those differences only explain nuance, not opposition. The so-called binary collapses when examined through facts instead of labels. This collapse matters because the binary is not just cultural, it is institutionalized. Walk into most dispensaries and you will still see flour divided into sativa, indica, or hybrid. Regulators in many states allow this labeling because it is simple, and operators continue it because it is familiar. But simplicity comes at the cost of accuracy. A consumer who buys Durban poison, expecting it to feel like caffeine, may be disappointed when its steady clarity feels more like calm focus than hyperactivity. A consumer who buys Hindu Kush expecting narcotic sedation may be confused when they feel relaxed, but still alert, even conversational. These mismatches erode trust not in the strains, but in the system describing them. The gap between label and experience is the product of marketing convenience, not plant truth. The alternative is not complicated. It is already in the plant. Terpene literacy provides a real framework for predicting effects. Terpinaline dominance, rare but defining, explains Durban Poison's cerebral lift more honestly than the word sativa ever could. Myrcene dominance in Hindu Kush explains muscle relaxation and body heaviness, but its limonene and pinene explain why it often leaves the mind clear. Caryophylline's ability to bind to CB2 receptors explains Hindu Kush's physical grounding. THCV's presence in Durban poison explains its sharp, appetite-suppressing energy. These are measurable, reproducible facts that directly connect chemistry to effect. Unlike the sativa indica shorthand, they are reliable for both bud tenders and consumers. For bud tenders, the shift means moving away from pointing at the indica jar when a customer asks for something relaxing, and instead explaining how a mere scene heavy THC dominant strain will likely feel compared to a limonene and pinene dominant one. For consumers, it means making choices based on what compounds are actually in the flower, not what category it has been stuffed into. For regulators and dispensaries, it means evolving menus to reflect terpene profiles and chemotypes rather than perpetuating a binary that science has already debunked. Durban Poison and Hindu Kush prove the point with clarity. If even these so-called archetypes of sativa and indica blur together when chemistry is considered, then no strain can be honestly described by those labels. The future of cannabis literacy lies not in botanical categories, but in chemical composition. Terpenes, cannabinoids, and their interactions explain experience. Labels do not. To move forward, the industry must abandon a system built on convenience and replace it with one built on accuracy. Until that happens, consumers will continue to be misled, and the true complexity of the plant will remain hidden behind words that never told the truth to begin with. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. It does not promote or encourage the use of cannabis in jurisdictions where it is illegal. Always comply with your local laws and regulations. The content presented here is not medical advice. For health-related questions about cannabis use, consult with a licensed healthcare professional.